Yeah, it's after uh, two minutes after, so <laughs> let's have a worship together. It's so nice to see uh, everybody here. The words here. I put the fan there for the word. <laughs> God gets more respect to me. I'm sure yes, I'm he's the most important here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, uh, John is here, the, our drummer. He's not doing it today because we're just doing the hymn today. Uh, but he's here. Uh, you know, uh, you guys heard about the USS Abraham Lincoln's uh, the helo crash that he it was at last week. Yeah, he was uh, on there too. So, huh? Why is he going to play the drum? We're, we're only singing the hymns today. So we're going to just do the a cappella. Well, he can still play drum. <laughs> Why are you tell him, Pastor Henry? Well, he, he's my boss, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Anyway, uh, he's here, and then uh, next week we actually going to have a guitarist. Uh, yeah, uh, it's actually from his ship, from the another uh, the young sailor from the Abraham Lincoln. So who knows? Maybe uh, at the end of the we're going to have to hold the Abraham Lincoln coming over here. <laughs> there you go. I know. So uh, good to Is have him. Going to play next week. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Next week I'm going to actually sing the regular songs because this week I only picked a hymn because it's going to be a cappella. It's so much easier to sing the uh, hymn as a cappella. If you read my text message, Pastor Henry, <laughs> maybe you know what's going on. <laughs> All right, we're going to sing um, uh, a few, uh, we're going to sing one hymn, and then Pastor Henry will come up and he's going to make some announcement, and then we're going to sing another hymn. Okay? Blessed Jesus is mine, oh what a Once again, we give you thanks for permitting us to come to this place to worship you. We pray that everything that is said and done, and as we sing, it will all be.
to honor and to praise you, our Father. And we thank you that you love us, you forgive us, and you care for us each and every moment of our lives. And Father, now we pray that as we worship, that each of us will open our hearts and our minds to your presence. And may you speak to us and reveal to us that which it is you want us to do for you. And again, Father, we come to worship you, to praise your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Welcome. I'm glad everybody is here. We still got, uh, got a good group today. Uh, I don't know if it's a special day or not. It's the day after 9-11. And I know you had some good times yesterday. And I just want to call you to your attention some announcements that's on the back of your bulletin. If you turn the back of the bulletin over, you'll see a new one there. It's Operation Christmas Child. We've done this before, and uh, here is the packet for the Project Leader Resource Kit. At this time, I don't know who the Project Leader will be, uh, because there's someone out there, out there. <laughs> out there where among you sit and uh, Pete I don't volunteer your wife <laughs> but if she is wanting to do this this Christmas child what it is you pack shoe boxes and I don't know if it, um, some of you probably heard of Samaritan's Purse uh, run by Franklin Graham. He does this every year. His organization, Samaritan's Purse, does this every year. And they send those shoe boxes all over the world, including our country, the United States of America and its territories. And uh, they get this as a Christmas present. Many of them wouldn't get anything if it wasn't for this. And it's all done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, we've done this before, and uh, it's a wonderful thing for us to be involved in, and I want us to do it. Uh, if I have to, I'm, I'm an expert at volunteering other people. <laughs> So you think about this, if you would like to, you can take this packet and peruse it and go through it and see what it says and how it's done. It's relatively a nice thing to do, I think, for, for this time of year that we're coming up. Pardon? Did somebody say something? Yeah, somebody's phone. Me and Pat's here. All right, you got it. Come up and get it, Pat. <laughs> These guys are great. I'm telling you, they're doing a wonderful ministry through our church to, to these veterans. <laughs> I'm glad you guys volunteered. You ought to get your... Uh, uh, some of these ladies around here to help you too because they're good at doing things like that Okay, so let's continue our worship in song Gia It was really um, nice to see Pat's face when he was voluntold <laughs> Thanks Pete <laughs> Okay, we're going to do the uh, second uh, hymn here. Yes, the deer pen is full, the waters of my soul. Thank you. 
All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody doing good today? Yes. Yeah. Well, you're doing good now. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens here in a little bit. Um, Henry touched on yesterday was the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Uh, That's It's been a rough chapter in our country's history. Um, especially lately. You know, we, we lost some on the way out the door. And then we just recently lost some more. It's not an easy business. And I just, I look out here and I see, it's like a mirror. I see a bunch of broken down old military people like me. And it makes me proud. It really does. On, on a day like this, to gather together in the house of the Lord, to hear God's word, to lift up our voices, even if they're not very good like mine, um, to lift up our voices in praise. It's amazing. And so when, when we go and, and we fight, it's not just where we're going that we're fighting for. And even in a time like this, when it seems like hope is hard to come by, that's the hope we can hold on to is look around. I mean, this is, this is who we fight for. It, it's, it's for us. It's the family of God. It's the children of God. It's, it's the people that he has created. You know, it's the person next to you. So I'm honored to be here. I'm thankful that Henry's given me another opportunity to come up here and bring God's word. I, it's humbling to me, it really is, for a guy that's thrived on ego most of his entire life to step up here on a Sunday and to feel unworthy and unable. <laughs> God is good. He's, uh, he's teaching me humility, sometimes by punching me in the gut, because <laughs> I need it. I've got a thick head. Uh, anyway, I'm glad to have you here. I love each and every one of you. Uh, I pray for each and every one of you through the week. I love preparing for these messages. I pray that God's just going to push me out the way, and he's going to have a word for us today. But before we do that, I, I would be remiss in my duties if I didn't have a start in our traditional prayer. And we found out that Aaron Ankeny, the pastor that I stole that from, he's still preaching at a church down in Florida. So uh, I, I spied on him and I watched one of his sermons recently. <laughs> so it was kind of neat. And he's still doing it too. So I, I feel good. Dear Lord, as we come to this point in our worship experience together, I ask that either through me or in spite of me, that you would speak to us and change our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, we're in the Gospel of Mark. Um, for those of you that fell asleep for the past 18 months, we're still in the Gospel of Mark. Um, and uh, <laughs> we're going to be taking a pretty good chunk today. Um, I want to be faithful to the Word, but I also want to get us moving along here a little bit. So this passage could easily be broken down and, and I mean there could be a dozen sermons just on this selection alone uh, but we're just going to do one so don't I saw a couple of eye rolls going on like 12 just just one for today don't worry so uh, we're, we're running through the seventh chapter of the gospel of Mark and I will be reading that for you because I'm too lazy to type it all because it's a lot <laughs> The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law, who had come from Jerusalem, gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. 
But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. Are you so dull? He asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. This is God's word. So we're going to break down this chunk of scripture and point out a couple of things that I think are really important for us to, to understand. So it starts out by saying the Pharisees and scribes came from Jerusalem. Now this isn't the first time it's happened. Now you, you know you're big time when the other people that are big time are trying to take you down at the knees. In football, you try and knock out the best player on the other team. In a lot of sports, that's what you did. Hockey used to have the goon. You know, you'd have that big guy that could barely skate, but he knew how to throw a punch on the ice. And so you know that if that eight foot tall behemoth gets out there and he's trying to skate over, you know someone's gonna be bleeding and he's gonna spend five minutes in the box. This is what we see here. Because Jerusalem, where the temple is, where the temple worship is, where the center of, of Jewish life and Jewish religion, where that is, that's where the delegation is being sent from. So word is getting around. You know, Jesus, he's, he's stirring up a hornet's nest. And so they send another delegation from Jerusalem. These Pharisees, these teachers of the law, and they want to call Jesus to account. So they're going out there to observe what he's doing and saying, and they're going to report back to the chief priest and the rest of his little cadre that are trying to take Jesus out. And so you know that this is a point in his ministry where it's accelerating towards the close. Now, we, we spoke a few weeks ago about how there was that, that big turning point in Jesus' ministry, right? Before he would go out, he would preach, and he would explain the parables to the crowd. He didn't do that here. It says that after the parable, and after kind of calling these Pharisees to account and saying, Okay, guys, uh, let me tell you ten ways that you're screwed up. I hope you have a pencil and write this down. And, and he just kind of knocked through some stuff. And then when he left, they get back, they're indoors, and, and the disciples have to go and say, hey, Jesus, you want to let us in on what that was? Now, the interesting thing about the parallel account of Matthew is Matthew says that Peter asked the question, and Jesus said, are you so dull? Like, dude, you seriously don't get it. Notice in Mark's gospel, Peter doesn't get dimed out. It was they, the disciples. They asked Jesus, and Jesus said, you guys are so dull. Because Peter probably didn't want to dime himself out on that one. So Matthew had no problem saying, oh yeah, Peter, he got called out for being an idiot. And then Mark's like, yeah, I'll leave Peter's name out of this and just say that it was the disciples. So Jesus is focusing his ministry on building up his disciples, while at the same time holding off the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Because what he saw there is something that we see around us today. When he quoted from Isaiah and, and said that your lips and your heart are doing different things. 
Like people, they, they say they love God or they honor God with their lips, but not with their heart. You see, everything that Jesus is saying there, it boils down to one thing, and that is true worship. And these A-list Jews from Jerusalem don't understand true worship. When the Jews were in exile in Babylon, completely uprooted, taken away from the temple, taken away from everything they knew, they come back and they're trying to figure it all out again. So they start making up these traditions. You have these rabbis that go and, and they sort of interpret and add on to the prescriptions of Moses. And so you, you've heard that you know, there, there's hundreds of additional rules and commandments that some of these observant Jews, especially the Pharisees, held on to. But what Jesus is saying is you, you have all these rules that you put in place and, and you say, you profess that that is to honor and worship God. But it doesn't. How can you say that eating with hands that aren't sin, and this is not about sanitation, you know? It, it's not that they had dirt under their fingernails and they were going to eat, like, oh my gosh, that's terrible. It was a ceremonial cleaning. It, it was public. It was visible. It was a ritual. It was not about cleanliness. It was about a public display. It was, look at, look at me. Look, look, look how awesome I am. I, I will ritually wash my hands so I don't defile this body that God has built. And Jesus says, you don't get it. it it's not the external, it's the internal that matters. Come on, David was a man after God's own heart, right? When, when David was being selected from amongst his brothers... His dad didn't even bring him in from the field. The prophet's there, and he's like, I'm here to anoint one of your sons. And he goes, sweet. Here's my first four. He's a big, strapping, handsome man. He looks like a king. No, nope, passing on him. Well, that second son, he's, he's pretty awesome, too. You ought to take a look at that guy. No, nope, not him. And they went down the entire run until finally, it's like, well, this is awkward. God said I was supposed to anoint one of your sons as the next king, and uh, I gotta be honest, I'm not, I'm not feeling any one of these. Like, isn't there anyone else? Well, David, a little pip squeak out there, chasing sheep around, playing his little flute. Yeah, yeah, bring him. And it's the kid that gets picked for Team Jesus. They're like, yes, this is the one. He's the one that's going to be anointed. And they're like, you got to be kidding me. King Saul is like this. David's like that. If you're drafting a team, you want the big strapping guy. And God says, no, you don't get it. It's, it's not the outside. It's not the appearance. It's the heart. Okay, so David, he... He committed adultery. He committed murder. He, he lied. He broke God's commandments. How is that a man after God's own heart? Because he repented. Because he went back to God. He worshipped God. In the greatest day, in the worst day, his life was about worshipping God. God saw his heart. God saw who David was. When no one else did, he saw into the heart. He saw the motivation. Yeah, David's human. He's going to screw up. There was exactly one perfect human being in the history of everything, and that was Jesus Christ. The rest of us, I'm sorry to say, we're, we're not going to meet that mark on our own. So even David, a man after God's own heart, even though he fell, God saw what was inside. It's not the external David didn't just praise God with his lips. It was into his very heart. Now, we think, you know, like deep down inside, you know, in your heart and your soul, that's what God's talking about. It's not the external show. 
It's not what you're doing for other people to see. You know, Jesus said when, when you're giving, don't let your other hand know what you're doing, right? If you give with your right hand, don't let your left know what's going on. If you give with your left, don't let your right know what's going on. When you pray, don't, don't be like these guys, these A-list celebrity Jews from Jerusalem, these Pharisees that have these long, loud prayers in the public square say, thank you, God, that I'm not a slave or a Gentile or a woman. Thank you that you made me such an awesome Jewish male. So they can go out there and it sounds like they're being pious. It sounds like they're giving glory and honor to God. Because they're saying, thank you, God, that I am so awesome and not like that guy. I don't really see that as honoring to God. And God didn't see that as honoring either. That's why Jesus called out behavior like that. He says, when you pray, what do you do? Go pray in secret. Get a little prayer closet. Go in there. Have time alone with your father. And that's when you really connect. That's when you open your heart to him. That's when you have that time with God. It's not the showy stuff out there in the public square. If you're doing it to have a relationship, admiration from other people, that's where it ends. That's your reward. If it's all about show, that's all you're going to get. Jesus is trying to teach everyone in the crowd. He's starting with the Pharisees by calling them out and saying, you hypocrites. You know, you, you say that you love God. You say that you honor God. And yet you pit scripture against itself. God says, honor your father and mother. And if you don't, you're going to be put to death. That's pretty serious. I'm thinking God was, you know, not only did he put it in the top ten, he hammered it home a few more times. Because that's supposed to be a picture of our relationship with God as Father. We honor the authority that's over us, our parents, as we honor God who's in authority over everything. And if we're going to dishonor our parents, how much more are we going to dishonor God? So there's a section, if you want to flip back to Leviticus, you can. It, I'll, I'll paraphrase it for you. Uh, basically, there's, when they're talking about giving in the temple, there's that word, korban. Now, it, it means to bring. That, that's pretty simple. You know, you, you say that you're going to bring uh, a sin offering, a guilt offering, a, a joy offering, something before the Lord. You dedicate that to God, and you bring it into the temple. Sounds good. Well, these oral traditions that they had I mean, they, they weren't even written down until, you know, like 200 years later. It was like 80, 200 they wrote down the mission. Before that, it was just a bunch of rabbis passing this stuff along for centuries. Well, this rule of Korban, it was basically saying like, oh, this one's off limits. So if mom and dad get to a point where they need some help, and you're in a position to help them, but you don't want to because it's going to negatively impact your standard of living, Thanks, Mom and Dad. I know you're having a rough time right now, but um, uh, Corban, all that uh, all that money I have, sorry, I'm, I'm dedicating it to the Lord. I don't know exactly when I'm bringing it to the temple, but I, I will. At some point, most likely, probably, actually follow through on that vow. But it wasn't formal. And, and there are ways that they could undo this vow. So Jesus is, is laying it bare in front of them. And they're saying, well, Scripture says that, you know, if it's set aside, it's for the Lord. You can't touch it. Scripture also says, honor your father and mother. God doesn't pit his word against his word. But that's what they were trying to do. And so Jesus is saying, no, you, you can't make up your own rule here about how you want to handle your life and your finances and go against a commandment of God. You're basically elevating yourselves above God. You're saying that what you think is right, what you want to do, is more important than what God has told you to do. And so you, you allow this to happen. You, you make these vows of Korban. You set stuff aside that could be used to, to help your parents, to honor your parents, to honor that primary relationship. But you don't. 
hypocrites. You do the things for show. You tithe your dill, your mint, your cumin. I mean, if you're taking 10% out of your spice rack, you're pretty serious about that, right? But does God really need your dill and your mint and your cumin? It's, it's not the percentage, it's the heart. It's not the show, it's the heart. All these external things that, that Jesus is confronting, these people don't get it. Now, I said this is something that we see around us today. And you're like, well, I, I don't Corbin anything. I don't even know what that meant until five minutes ago, and I'll forget it as soon as the service is over. Yeah, you might. Corbin is not something that you typically come up with in a casual conversation. But false teaching? Do we have any false teaching today? Yeah, I'd say so. Do we have people that misrepresent the Word of God? Yeah, I'd say so. Is eternity in the balance with that? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. Jesus is really breaking it down in simple terms. Now, it, some people think that Jesus didn't really have a sense of humor, that God doesn't have a sense of humor. Well, that's not true. We're made in his image. We are made to reflect God. So therefore, we have emotions, God has emotions. We have a sense of humor, God has a sense of humor. Have you ever seen a platypus? Look it up sometime. It's like God had his workshop where he was making animals and he had a bunch of little bits left over and he's like, um, all right, we'll take a furry little that, we'll take a duck bill, let's put a pouch on that thing. Um, I don't know. You just cobble it all together. You see something like that and you're like, God has a sense of humor because that is a weird looking animal. So here, Jesus is basically calling out what these guys are doing. And he says, you know, they're, they're missing the mark here. It's not what goes into you that makes you defiled and dirty. It's what comes out of you. This one's for you, Pete. Because what, what you take in, it doesn't go to your heart. It goes to your stomach, and then it leaves the body. <laughs> that's, that's how it works. So this is Jesus basically saying what these guys are teaching is what comes out the other end. So if you don't think Jesus has a sense of humor, and he's saying, yeah, these false teachers, it's a bunch of crap. Literally. So he's calling them out like that. But he's saying it's, it's not what goes into you that matters. It, it's what comes out of you. So when Jesus is challenged, he, he doesn't fight back dirty. He doesn't do what other people do. He doesn't start calling names or any of that stuff. When he's wandering in the desert, he's being tempted by Satan. And he's being challenged. What does he do? He goes to Scripture. That's how he responds. And so here you get these people that are coming in here and they're trying to call him out. And saying, look at you people with your defiled hands and you're eating. And he's like, hey, you know what? You know that guy Isaiah? Yeah, he, you, yeah, he actually talked about you. You're a bunch of hypocrites. And the stuff you're teaching is what comes out of the body after you have a meal. He's throwing down the gauntlet by going to scripture. He's saying, God's word says this, not your traditions... Not these things that you've handed down, not something that a rabbi made up in Babylon hundreds of years ago. No, God's holy, inspired, true word. That's what matters. So he goes to scripture to make his point. He makes a joke to further his point. And then he takes it a step deeper. Because when he's talking about what comes out of the heart, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty heavy list of things. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, slander. i got to stop take a breath in the middle of this list. Arrogance and folly. 
that comes out of the heart. Out of Jesus' heart comes scripture. What comes out of your heart? I'll be honest, I'm, I don't believe scripture. What comes out of my heart all too often are things that I would rather not. But that's when I lean even more into the Lord. When I realize that my heart may not be as much after God as I want it to be. And that's when I ask him again, please, work on me. I don't want this to come out. You know, Jesus said, if you have hate in your heart, it's as if you committed murder. If you have lust in your heart, it's as if you commit adultery. What did David do? Murder, adultery, not just in his heart. That's what came out. That's how important this is to have a heart that's right with God. That's what Jesus is hammering home. All the externalities. Doesn't matter. You don't get defiled from without. Your defilement is within. And that's what manifests. So if you know a tree by its fruit, whether it's good or it's bad, that's your fruit. What comes out of your heart? That's your fruit. So Jesus, as he is teaching his disciples, he's saying, look, you got to get your heart right. Because that's really the center of who you are. And if you give your heart to the Lord, if you, if you offer it up to him, Guess what? That's when he makes you more like Jesus. That's sanctification. That's the process. I mean, we're not going to get there in this life. But we'll get closer. Every time we skip these externalities, you know, the, the, the TV preachers back in the day, like Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, you know, I think they're doing a, a new show on them on Netflix or something. They got caught up in worldliness. And it was no longer about a relationship with God. It was no longer their heart. It was the externalities. It, it was the money. It was the fame. It was all the other stuff. All this worldliness that they got caught up in. And their heart was for the world. And since you can't serve two masters... They gave up on the true one. We see that in a lot of megachurch movements today, where it's it, it's all about show and flash, and, it, and it's not about substance. It's not about a relationship with God. There's there's no repentance. There's no concept of sin. There's there's nothing. I mean, it's it's not the gospel. It's really not. And I want us all to be able to discern between them, between a true and a false gospel. Because if it doesn't honor God, if it doesn't glorify God, if it honors and glorifies men, us, over God, that's not the gospel. The gospel is about Jesus. Now, it's, it's for us, of course, but the gospel is not about us. It's not. The gospel is about the Lord. It's about Jesus. It's about God. It's about us being brought back into relationship with him. And that's the amazing thing is that we have that opportunity. So don't focus on the external. Don't, don't, don't just let your lips speak praise, but then your heart do something else. 
depending on how far it is from here to here, you can miss heaven by that much. Because if you're thinking you're doing the right stuff and you're saying the right stuff, but it doesn't change you here, you can miss heaven by that much. I don't want any of you to do that. I don't want me to do that. Take it in. And then let it out. That's the cross. That's the work of Jesus right there, laid out in front of us. Take him into your heart. Let him change you. And then let that fruit, that good fruit, come out. And change the world. Lord God, we thank you for everything. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. We thank you for each and every person here. We pray, Lord, that you would change us, that as we open our hearts more and more to you, that you would fill us more completely, that you would conform us more completely to the image of Jesus. Lord, I pray that anything in this message that was for me would drop to the floor and would be left, that anything that was from you would pierce us straight through the heart. We love you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for the message. Learning the new word today, korba, huh? I think we all have a korba in our heart, uh, and that we do that also uh, to justify our action, right? Twisting the words and everything just to justify us. So thank you so much. Uh, if you can, please stand up. And then we're going to sing the last hymn here together. The Old Rugged Cross. And then Wesley will uh, lead this one. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The
I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for that message. Yes, we all need to pay attention to what comes out of our mouth and it ought to be in line with the, the fruits of the Spirit of the living God. And uh, we ought to pray for that each and every day we wake up. May, may my life be something that Jesus is directing and not just me. Thank you, musicians, for being here. You sound good singing. Everybody <laughs> out there. All right. Even me? Even you. Uh, even, you. <laughs> even, even you. Does that make you feel good? <laughs> All right. All right. By the way, Pat and Pete can't do this uh, uh, Christmas uh, child project alone. Yeah, project by themselves when they read that. that we got uh, vets. We and, got vets. Well, we got ladies and we got men and we got even children that can can go out and purchase stuff to put in the box and uh, we purchase. We'll purchase the box. Don't worry about that and uh, get them together and put them together and, uh, and then we'll take them to a collection point and they will be delivered from there on out. But I'll be putting more stuff in the bulletin each and every Sunday for that. Well, our time has run out. I'm so glad to see everybody here. Wow, some of you have driven quite a ways. I know Cowboy and Annette and Travis have come from Del Zorro. When you see them each and every Sunday, boy, it's a, that bless you. God's got something special for you. He sure does. And so all the rest of us. Okay. God bless you. Invite your friends, your neighbors, and your family members to come next time. Okay? And uh, so let's bow in prayer and ask Chris to lead us in our benediction. Receive a benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. 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 Have a good week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.